Hello, everyone. Welcome to this launch panel as part of the Kappa National Student Case Competition. My name is Eric Champagne. I am a professor at, of public administration and the director of the Center on Governance at the University of Ottawa. And today I have the privilege to moderate this uh, fantastic panel this afternoon. Uh, I'm, I am accompanied actually with uh, four wonderful panelists whom I will introduce in a few seconds. Alors, bonjour tout le monde. J'ai le plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à cette table ronde organisée dans le cadre de la compétition annuelle d'études de cas organisée par euh, l'ACPAP. Mon nom est Éric Champagne. Je suis un professeur en administration publique à l'Université d'Ottawa et je suis aussi le directeur du Centre d'études en gouvernance de la même université. On m'a confié aujourd'hui la tâche d'organiser, euh, d'animer de, 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 plutôt ce panel euh, et je suis accompagné aujourd'hui par quatre fantastiques invités que je vais vous présenter dans quelques secondes. Before going further, I would like to recognize that I am speaking to you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I want to express my gratitude to the generations of Algonquin people, past and present, as the original caretakers of this space I occupy today. I am very grateful to be here. Je voudrais commencer par reconnaître que je me trouve sur le territoire traditionnel non cédé des Algonquins à Nishinabé. Je viens à exprimer ma gratitude envers les générations passées et présentes du peuple algonquin. qui sont les premiers gardiens de l'espace que j'occupe et je suis uh, très reconnaissant. The subject of today's panel is a journey to of new public servants, expectations versus reality. I would like to say that this panel is jointly organized by the Canada School of Public Service, CAPA, uh, Carleton University, and many other partners. And what I'm gonna, going to try to do with this panel is to draw from the experience of young professionals who recently entered the public service and get them to talk more specifically about their transition from being a student to being a civil servant. So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our four panelists. Let's start with Charnel Morgan. Charnel is a senior policy advisor working in operations at the Privy Council office, leading the advancement of a number of social policies. Charnel is also the co-founder of the Canadian Black Policy Network and Toronto Black Policy Conference, a not-for-profit not organization aimed at creating a safe space for Black community members and allies to explore policy issues affecting Canada's Black communities. Chanel, Charnel est passionnée par la création d'espaces équitables et par l'engagement dans les politiques publiques. Elle est reconnue comme un leader émergente et a été sélectionnée comme boursière d'Action Canada pour 2021-2022. Elle a été aussi reconnue comme l'une des 100 femmes les plus puissantes en 2022, en sa qualité de leader du RBC Future Launch. Maintenant, permettez-moi de présenter Catherine Leblanc. Catherine is a proud Acadian with extensive experience in the federal public service. She began her public service career in 2015 as a student as at, at Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs Canada. Elle est actuellement analyste principale des programmes à Pêche et Océan Canada et coprésidente du Réseau des jeunes fonctionnaires fédéraux du Nouveau-Brunswick. Elle est une graduée en administration publique de l'Université d'Ottawa et d'une maîtrise de l'Université de Moncton. Et si je peux me permettre d'ajouter sur une note plus personnelle, elle est aussi une de mes anciennes étudiantes à l'Université d'Ottawa et nous sommes très fiers de son parcours professionnel. Next, I would like to introduce Jérôme Bilodeau. Jérôme is the director of the building, building division at NRC CAN, Office of Energy Efficiency. He oversees there the delivery of, of programs and policies aiming to save energy and reduce green ga, greenhouse gas emissions. En outre, Jérôme enseigne la politique d'efficacité énergétique à l'Université Carleton. Il siège au Conseil d'administration du Conseil international du Canada, la section euh, cap de la capitale nationale et au comité directeur de l'Alliance mondiale pour les bâtiments et la construction de l'ONU. Last but not least, uh, we have Anandu, Anandu Nair with us today. Anandu is, at, is an IT advisor at Employment and Social Development Canada. 
He graduated with his master's in public policy from the Monk School in 2021. He holds an undergrad degree in biotechnology from the University of Toronto. Anandu a travaillé comme analyste commercial pour Rogers Communications et comme analyste junior pour l'École de la fonction publique du Canada sur divers projets axés surtout sur la technologie. Il est spécialisé dans l'analyse commerciale, la gestion de projets, la transformation numérique et la prestation de services. Here's what we're going to do today. I will take about 20 minutes to kick off the conversation with some initial questions, but most importantly, we want to answer your questions. So at any time, you can use the Q&A button that you can see at the bottom of your screen. Write your question. We only take written questions. So write your question in English or in French. Um, and I'm going to pick some of them to feed the discussion. Donc, je vais d'abord prendre une vingtaine de minutes pour lancer la conversation en posant quelques questions initiales. Mais le plus important, je le, je le répète, euh, c'est que nous voulons répondre à vos questions. Donc, à tout moment, vous pouvez utiliser le bouton qui, qui s'appelle Q&A, Q&A, que vous trouverez en bas de votre écran. Écrivez vos questions en français ou en anglais. Je vais les sélectionner pour alimenter la suite de notre discussion. Now, let's start with a very general question. Uh, I'll start with by asking our panelists, what skills help you most in your transition from academia, from academia to the public service? And does the federal government provide any professional development opportunities? And I'd like to start with the same order. So Charnel first, uh, what's your take on this, Charnel? Yeah, so I think I would probably say that the skills that helped me the most were being able to, so I, I graduated from the the uh, Monk School of Global Public Affairs and Public Policy some years ago. And so um, the degree that I kind of took was really focused on writing. Um, and so I, you know, was able to write position papers within grad school um, and transitioning out of grad school into the federal public service. Uh, a lot of those same skills were required. It was really being able to write concisely, being able to research and really to develop a coherent narrative or argument to be able to put forth into a paper that's going to be sent to senior management or a deputy minister. Um, I think I also relied on some of my work experience and volunteer experience, right? So really being able to engage um, uh, with interpersonal skills, uh, working in teams that I developed throughout grad school, that, that same skills transitions to the workplace, um, no matter what you're doing, if you have to reach across a different team or call or a secretariat to kind of grab information um, to really be able to uh, lead on that deliverable. So I would probably say just teamwork was one of the skills, um, strong communication, um, as well as being able to write effectively and concisely and to demonstrate an argument that, you know, translates from when you're working in grad school for your papers, the same thing goes on when you're in the workplace. Merci, Charnel. Thank you. Uh, uh, J'aimerais me tourner vers uh, Catherine maintenant. Catherine, uh, que ça ta réponse à cette question? Ben, un peu similaire à ce que Charnel euh, expliquait, l'habileté la, d'écrire, de, de rédiger des rapports, faire de la recherche, c'est certain que c'est des, des atouts, des, des habiletés qui étaient nécessaires au début, surtout... Euh, Moi, dans mon cas, la maîtrise que j'ai faite en administration publique, c'était une maîtrise professionnelle. Donc, euh, voulant dire qu'on n'avait pas de thèse, on n'avait pas de mémoire, il fallait faire un stage. Donc, c'était ça mon expérience. Puis. J'ai perdu. Euh... C'est revenu, je crois. Perdu... M'entendez-vous toujours? Oui. Oui, OK. Moi, je ne vous entends plus. Mais, euh, donc. Euh... <rire> Euh, dans le cadre de ma maîtrise, c'est ça, je devais faire un stage et donc euh, cette expérience-là est venue m'aider un peu. Mais euh, je dirais aussi que du côté plutôt euh, du côté plutôt de l'apprentissage, du fonctionnement du gouvernement aussi, qu'on apprend au sein de nos cours d'administration de, de, publique ou sciences politiques, public policy, peu importe ce que vous étudiez, ça, ça m'a vraiment euh, aidé aussi. C'est venu vraiment m'aider aussi là, pendant... Euh, Au début de ma carrière, surtout comprendre vraiment la machine gouvernementale, puis tout ce que, comment les, les différents ministères fonctionnent, les agents centraux, donc des choses comme ça. Donc, euh, je dirais que ça aussi, c'est des atouts qu'on ne pense pas toujours à, qui viendraient nous servir euh, comme, euh, comme employés de la fonction publique fédérale, mais c'est un gros morceau, je dirais. OK, merci Catherine. Maintenant, Jérôme, à ton tour. 
Oui, je crois qu'on va, on va peut-être se répéter un peu, mais c'est mon expérience, c'est que les compétences euh, générales c est, c est, sont tout aussi importantes que les compétences techniques. Donc, de mon côté, de la même façon, la communication est absolument critique. Donc, être capable d'écrire de façon claire et concise, précise et structurée est absolument critique. Et c'est pas, on, on pense que c'est facile, on pense que c'est courant et ça ne l'est pas. J'ai passé beaucoup de temps à embaucher des gens et je dois vous dire que les, la, les compétences de communication sont beaucoup plus difficiles à trouver que des compétences techniques. Deux autres compétences générales, je dirais, qui sont critiques, c'est euh, tout d'abord d'avoir une vue d'ensemble et donc être capable de pouvoir non seulement comprendre l'objectif et les, les tâches d'un emploi en particulier, mais de comprendre le contexte plus général les politiques plus générales et ce qu'on cherche à accomplir. Donc, euh, c'est assez classique, je dirais, au début de carrière, c'était mon cas sûrement, euh, d'être un peu dans les détails, alors qu'on veut être capable de démontrer une compréhension euh, plus générale. Finalement, c'est, je dirais aussi, les compétences interpersonnelles. Une des caractéristiques particulières du gouvernement, c'est que c'est énorme. C'est la plus grosse organisation au pays. Et donc, la meilleure façon d'être efficace, c'est d'être capable non seulement de travailler avec les autres, mais de savoir à qui parler, comment les comment les convaincre et de faire certaines choses, et, et c'est absolument critique. Donc, euh, voilà, compétences générales avant compétences techniques, je Excellent, je vous remercie. Uh, let's turn now to uh, Anandu. What's your take on this question, Anandu? The tough part about going last is to keep up with some of these amazing answers and uh, uh, kind of apply resourcefulness. Um, one thing I would say is the, it's kind of touching on what uh, Chernel and uh, I was talking about is the ability to take a lot of information and kind of compact it into digestible content because a lot of times your managers your directors ADMs are very very busy people and they don't have the time to read as much as you do so ability to gather a vast array of information and then compact it into something digestible I, I feel like it's one of the crucial skills uh, that uh, I feel like you really hone in graduate school you were often reading hundreds and hundreds of pages a week and you can you kind of have to be put in a situation where you have to compact that uh and, and make it understandable easily through decks or briefs or briefing notes right another thing i would say is problem solving often i feel like what distinguishes high caliber analysts is that they're told what the problem is by senior management or executives and it's your if you're in an advisor position it's your job to come up with a strategy to address that problem and ingenuity i feel like is one of the the most powerful things that you can apply in your profession, right? Like how do we fix problems? If you're a natural problem solver, then you will turn turn heads because you are able to, um, you know, find creative solutions to very multifaceted challenges. And I, and I joke about this with my consultant friends all the time. Like I ask them, what's the, what's the skill that, uh, that, you know, that you guys really think that, um, that you see in your field a lot, they say we're advanced Googlers. And, I, and, and that's kind of funny, but it's actually really true, right? If you get like Google, the internet has everything. It has all the information you'll ever need and the, the access to technologies at a scale that we've never seen before. So if you can really understand how to research, how to compile that information and apply it to your advisor roles, I think you'll like stand aside from the crowd, right? So I think those two things. The last thing I'll also say is be bold. Not everybody might agree with this, but don't be scared. You're coming from academia, you're well-educated people, you can think, you have critical thinking skills, so apply those thinking skills. I, 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 was, I remember when I was in, uh, working for the school, the Canvas School, I started my federal public career there. Um, and I, I'll say this, it's completely different working at the school compared to any of these larger departments because it's so big, right, compared to the school. But one thing I noticed right, right away about the Canvas School of Public Service is that you'll have that relationship with your senior management Uh, and executives, I don't think that you'll really get at any other department. And they didn't pay me to say this. I just genuinely feel like that because I started my career there. Um, but be bold in the sense that, you know, ask really, really good questions. I guarantee you other people in that meeting have the same question. But if a DG is talking or a director is talking, sometimes there's this kind of facade that you can't ask questions. No, ask the questions, because if they can provide answers to your questions, it's clearly a gap. Right. And you might be the one that found that gap. And then people will be like, okay, maybe what does this person have to say about this? Because they ask really, really good questions. And I think that's also being, becoming a part of Bold to have that confidence to ask those tough questions and, and never feel bad about the questions you have because I guarantee other people will have the same questions as well. So, yeah. 
back to you. Hey, love, lovely, and I do. Um, uh, and, and something I take from from your answer is the importance of soft skills and in in, uh, in how you apply your competencies um, on top of your your uh, special uh, technical skills. So that's uh, very Im in interesting. A real great kickoff, and I'm I'm seeing a few questions in the Q and A. Keep uh, sending your questions. Continuez d'envoyer vos questions. Euh, nous allons y répondre dans quelques instants. Mais pour l'instant, je vais euh, aller vers une, une autre question, euh, si vous le permettez. Et donc, je vais... Uh, I will ask the second question uh, that we plan for... for and I'm sure that's going to be uh, of great interest for our uh, participants. So, so do you have any advice on the application process and how one can stand out from the other applicants when you apply in the, uh, for a job in, a, in, in the civil service? And uh, I'll do the reverse order this time, and Andu, so you'll be the first to, uh, to answer that question. Go ahead. I think one of the things I've had to grapple with myself is that I, even though I might seem very extroverted, I am an introvert to the core. I rather stay home, like with my family, rather than just go out and do stuff. That's just me personally. One thing I've had to learn throughout my professional career is that you have to be extroverted to get those opportunities. You, people need to know who you are and what you're able to bring to the table when you apply for these positions. And like it, these positions are very, very competitive. So getting that extra edge in terms of networking and talking to people, putting yourself out there, going to events and actually like showing people who you are, that's a big component of job hunting. Uh, I, I have, that's one of the lessons I've had to teach myself because I've had to like tell myself like, or like teach myself the skills to actually go out, talk, communicate confidently. And I think that kind of, a, kind of trans, translates to all other aspects of your life in, including uh, finding a career and then also shining in that career, right? So getting that skills to, even if you're an introverted person, to make pe make sure people know who you are and what you're able to bring to, the, bring to the table, right? You literally have to market yourself to potential employers. So that's one thing I would say. Other th thing in terms of uh, government process, they're very detail-oriented, right? Um, they're looking for very specific, concrete examples and you can't be lazy in these application process. I'm sorry, like it's it's a lot of effort. It takes time. Start early. Start early as possible and chip away at it little bit by little bit over the weeks, right? Because they're often asking for very, very specific examples where you have to list the situation, what the task was, what the action was, and what the eventual act actions led, led to the result. And that those kind of questions are often take a lot of time to think about, and you have to think through them thoroughly before you answer it's a very uh, it's a very heavy loaded process, but I feel like if you actually put in the effort in terms of preparing early in advance, that uh, you'll be able to reap the rewards. So yeah. Thank you, Anandu. Um, maintenant, uh, j'aimerais demander à, à Jérôme s'il a des conseils sur la procédure d'embauche ou uh, la manière de se démarquer des autres candidats. Jérôme. Je vais répondre de de deux façons. Tout d'abord, le processus, puis ensuite, une fois que tu as passé le processus. Et c'est important de tout d'abord comprendre comment le processus fonctionne. Et j'ai vu très souvent, j'ai vu très bien des gens qui, ont, qui, ont, qui étaient très qualifiés, qui n'ont pas réussi à, à, à passer parce qu'ils pensent que c'est une entrevue ou un, un, un processus semblable au secteur privé. Le processus fédéral est complètement différent et est très rigide, très strict, très standardisé. Donc, la première chose, c'est d'accepter cette réalité et de la comprendre et de vous trouver un coach. Trouvez quelqu'un qui a déjà fait ce genre de processus et demandez-leur comment ça fonctionne et comment est-ce que c'est différent. Ils vont vous expliquer que vous devez utiliser les mêmes mots qui sont dans, dans, le, dans la description du poste. Ils vont vous expliquer que vous devez donner des exemples comme Anandou vient d'expliquer. Ils vont vous expliquer tout ça. Et donc, c'est vraiment critique de jouer le jeu du système avant de même penser à la prochaine étape, je dirais. Donc, soyez réaliste sur le processus. Oui, ça prend du temps. Oui, c'est difficile et c'est long et c'est très différent, mais c'est vraiment important de jouer ce jeu et de, de vraiment faire face à la réalité. Première chose. Une fois que vous avez passé, vous êtes dans le système maintenant, c'est plus un peu comme dans le secteur privé, vous pouvez parler à des gestionnaires. Et donc là, pour vous démarquer, je, je dirais qu'il y a deux, trois choses. Un a déjà euh, mentionné quelque chose. Un, c'est qu'il faut être proactif. Donc, les gens ne vont pas vous 
Peut-être que les gestionnaires vont vous, en, vont vous contacter directement, mais c'est beaucoup mieux et préférable si c'est vous qui faites le premier pas. Donc, la chose, le conseil que je donne à bien des gens, c'est d'étudier GADS. Je ne sais pas c'est quoi en français, GADS, mais c'est le, le répertoire des employés fédéraux. Apprenez à comprendre qui est qui, est qui, qui fait quoi et écrivez-la. Écrivez-la directement, demandez, j'aimerais vous rencontrer, je me suis qualifié, avez-vous du temps la semaine prochaine? Soyez très précis. Et donc, après, une fois que vous pouvez rencontrer la personne, là, vous pouvez démontrer votre valeur, vous pouvez dé démontrer vos compétences euh, et votre intérêt pour le poste. Et c'est là que les autres choses, donc vos expériences, votre connaissance du sujet, votre connaissance du contexte et votre, vos, 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 vos compétences de communication, dont on a parlé tout à l'heure, c'est là que ça peut briller. Et vous comprenez, il y a tout un processus avant d'arriver là, donc il faut vraiment faire, euh, porter attention à ces étapes Hey, merci beaucoup, Jérôme, pour ces judicieux conseils. Et maintenant, Catherine, qu'auriez-vous à ajouter sur euh, ce sujet? Merci. Euh, vous m'entendez, là? On t'entend très okay, bien. Parfait, et merci. Sans nous entendre aussi, merci. <rire> oui, je vous entends. Euh, ben, Jérôme et Anandou ont pas mal couvert euh, ce que j'aurais proposé ou ce que j'aurais donné comme, euh, voyons, comme... Euh, comme astuce, là, comme truc. Mais un des meilleurs conseils que je me suis fait donner, puis ça, ça répète un peu ce qu'Anando a dit, mais c'était de répondre aux questions. Euh, si la question te demande euh, quelle couleur est le ciel, décris le ciel. Il est bleu, il y a des nuages blancs, il y a un soleil jaune, tu sais, maison. Puis quand tu penses qu'il n'y en a pas assez ou tu penses qu'il y a trop d'informations, excusez, quand tu penses qu'il y a trop d'informations, il n'y en a probablement pas assez. Donc, il faut vraiment mettre beaucoup d'informations, puis c'est comme ça que tu réussis à te démarquer vraiment parce que là, ton application est complète, puis les gens qui évaluent ton application sont capables de dire, OK, oui, cette personne-là est qualifiée ou on croit qu'elle serait qualifiée pour le poste. Donc, c'est vraiment de, de répondre aux questions, puis ça, c'est tant dans l'application euh, quand vous soumettez quelque chose en ligne que dans, euh, dans votre processus d'entrevue, par exemple, ou même euh, les examens, des choses comme ça. Donc, l'entrevue d'utiliser, d'être préparé. Euh, souvent, au gouvernement, on, a, on nous donne un peu de temps avant l'entrevue avec des questions pour se préparer, se donner un peu de... Euh, trouver des exemples. Donc, on ne sait pas des questions comme ça sur le tas. Donc, c'est de prendre le, le 20-30 minutes qu'on vous offre pour vraiment bien préparer vos réponses, puis d'avoir un peu, puis Anandou l'a mentionné dans sa réponse aussi, là, mais d'utiliser une structure, euh, situation, tâche, action, résultat. Donc, vraiment de suivre une structure, puis de répondre à ces questions-là, puis comme il faut. Donc, si vous suivez ça, habituellement, la personne qui évalue votre, euh, votre votre présentation ou l'entrevue, le, euh, c'est sûr que vous vous démarquez. D'avoir déjà été de l'autre côté de la table, c'est certain que les candidats, candidates là, qui répondent des questions comme ça, c'est beaucoup plus simple à évaluer puis à, à déterminer s'ils sont euh, s'ils si, ont les capacités ou les habiletés pour, euh, pour le poste qu'ils qu cherchent à pourvoir. Puis un peu pour euh, renchérir ce que Jérôme disait sur une fois que vous êtes euh, au sein de la fonction publique, il y a beaucoup plus, on dit souvent que c'est grand, c'est immense. Il y a des, des opportunités euh, infinies au gouvernement fédéral. Donc, euh, une fois que vous êtes là, c'est ça, c'est de réseauter, de rencontrer des gens, que vous participez à des panels comme ça, des fois, et vous, vous entendez quelqu'un parler, puis vous dites, ah, mais ben, ça serait intéressant de voir euh, qu'est-ce que cette personne-là fait, ou ça serait intéressant de travailler avec cette, euh, cette personne-là pour parce que ça, ça, vient chercher, ça vient chercher mes connaissances, ça vient chercher mes intérêts. Ben, c'est ça, c'est de ne pas se gêner, mais d'être précis, puis de poser vos questions. Euh, euh, avec des, le plus de détails possible aussi là, quand, euh, quand vous, vous communiquez avec ces personnes. -là. Souvent, les gens qui participent à des panels, là, je ne veux, veux pas parler pour mes copanélistes ici, là, mais je sais que dans mon cas, si quelqu'un veut me rejoindre, j'ai aucune aucun problème à, à recevoir des questions. Là, fait que c'est ça. Fait que souvent, les gens qui, qui se mettent l'avant comme ça, c'est des gens qui, qui sont ouverts à, à discuter avec vous là, pour répondre à des questions. Donc, euh, c'est ça les, les suggestions que j'aurais pour les gens qui, qui veulent. Là entrer au gouvernement fédéral. Formidable, Catherine, merci beaucoup. Je n'ai pas de doute que tu vas recevoir beaucoup de demandes de la part de nos, euh, de nos participants et c'est un avantage d'être ici aujourd'hui euh, pendant, euh, pendant notre discussion. Alors, uh, let's, let me turn to Charnel. Uh, what would you say, Charnel, about uh, how to apply and how to stand out from other candidates? What's your take? Yeah, um, I... I feel like my colleagues mentioned all the really good stuff um, and all the key important ones. So now I feel like I'm left scrambling. I was trying to take notes and trying to see what else I could say. Um, 
But I really do agree with Jérôme and Catherine that like, you know, these competitions are merit-based and they are very standardized. And so really having detailed responses and as Catherine mentioned, right, like using the STAR, um, the method, situation, task, action, result, and answering your questions would really help you. Um, the first time that I start to do these job applications, you kind of feel silly as you're writing it. If you feel silly, that means you're on the right track. Like you're really breaking down every step and you're like, well, this seems basic. Like, why do I have to explain? How did I research? But you want to show like, what did you do to research? So like you looked at, you know, secondary literature reviews or you looked at like, I don't know, like reports. If you really have to be super specific because because they're merit-based, they really need to be able to say yes, check mark or those who are evaluating it that like, yes, they clearly demonstrated how they conducted the research, how they analyzed. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Like if you feel silly writing it, maybe it's, it might be on the good track. Um, uh, again, like Catherine and Jérôme both mentioned, like network and connect with individuals. So if there's a job that you're really interested in um, or position or a level and you know someone who is at that stage, really go and just have a coffee chat with them. I have coffee chats to this day and I don't think I'll ever stop having coffee chats. I think they're so informative and just kind of pick their brain. I, one thing someone told me and I, and I, and I think this is so true, um, people love talking about themselves. <laughs> so when you really reach out to kind of like ask for advice, they're really um, honored to, to kind of share their experience. It's rare that I've ever had someone say no. So really rely on that and just reach out. Um, two things that I would probably say that I don't think were mentioned, uh, rely on all your experience. Like don't discount anything when you're applying to, um, like again, speaking in like the federal public service sense, count it all, like count your volunteer experience, count your education experience, count your work outside the public service or whatever it is. Like, don't discount it. And oftentimes I remember when I first started, I, I was hesitant to put on things I did, maybe that weren't necessarily considered maybe like no professional or wasn't paid work, but those experiences are really helped me to be able to get screened into those uh, job processes. So count all your experiences. And then the next tip I would say is um, you'll start to realize that a lot of the questions are quite similar within the public service. Um, when you do job applications. So I literally have a folder on my computer where it says, where it's titled GC jobs. So government of Canada jobs. And I, and I, when I'm done answering the questions in the application, I save them on a word doc and I just put them in a folder. Um, Cause oftentimes I could um, reuse or use that as a good template and build on it. Right. So your experiences will always stay the same or like your your skill set, but they'll likely in, be enhanced and improve over time as you're climbing the ladder up. And so you, your, question, your responses will be more detailed, um, but you still want to be able to kind of keep a bank. And I say that because it will save you half the time when you're applying to jobs the next time around because you have a good template and then you, all you have to do is just really build on it and expand um, to ensure that you're meeting the criteria as set out in the application. Lovely. Shauna, thank you so much. Uh, well, I'm going to myself, uh, you can expect that I'm going to schedule a little uh, coffee chat with you. Uh, it's I learned so much from uh, from what you're saying and from all the panel. And I take a few things um, as a lesson learned. Uh, first of all, everything counts, right? At, at your age, everything is is important. Something you don't think it can be important can be important. And I really appreciated your uh, your uh, advice to be proactive. You know, be a little bit more proactive to uh, try to distinguish yourself from from other people. Continuez à envoyer des questions. On en a quelques-unes dans l'espace pour les, les questions-réponses. Uh, je vais en prendre quelques-unes maintenant. Uh, I'll take a few questions from the crowd, uh, from the participants, and I'll start with the question from Kirian Junus. Uh, Kirian is asking, when you are in the process uh, to be bridged from, student, from a student position to a casual IT2, how do you bring up and negotiate your pay increment? Can I possibly get IT2 above level one? And yes, how and what can I bring it up? Um, I am a grad student with a few years past working experience. 
So I'm hoping to get higher level in the pay increment. For me, that makes sense to start with an undo. I think you have a little bit more experience in the uh, IT world. So I'll, I'll start with you. And if any of our panelists wants to uh, 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 pitch in uh, a few ideas, uh, I'll take your, um, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, a tour to you. And undo. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's very situation specific. For example, if you're bridging from your current team to an IT2 at a casual, then your manager clearly has been working with you for that semester or two semester or whatever it might be. So a more of a candid conversation can be had about, you know, where you should be get paid, getting paid at what step, depending on the skill set and the caliber that you've been able to display in that time that you've been working with that team, right? But I also feel like outside of that, um, you know, when you're having this conversation about being bridged into a position, I think managers, um, as far as I've seen, they have to really make the case about how your experiences are tied to that level that you're trying to get uh, bridged to. So, you know, as your manager could really, really like you and you might be a great analyst or an advisor, but at the same time, they have to make a case about why that pay increment is like required based on your experiences. But I feel like having a genuine candid conversation where you can sit down, be honest and show these are the X, Y, and Z that I've done compared to the market. This is what I think I should be getting paid based on my experience. That conversation should be candid uh, because if you don't have that conversation and this applies to any jobs anywhere, if you don't feel like you're being compensated at the level that uh, you think you should be compensated, that's not a good way to enter a new job because then you're going to feel like I'm getting slammed with a lot of work now and I'm not happy with where I am because I don't feel like I'm getting paid what I need to be getting paid. And that's not a good way to start a job or like any kind of job in my perspective, you you, you deserve to, you know, actually give that opportunity to try and get what you think you should be getting paid and having an honest conversation, regardless of the like level, like or classification. I don't think it's just IT limited. And I think, um, you know, any of the panelists would agree this applies to all the categories, like us, all categorizations and classifications, like having that genuine conversation and rather just being anecdotal. I don't think anecdotal really helps in that situation. I think I should be getting paid this because, you know, like I feel I'm a good person. No, like that is not how it's, how it works. You actually actually have an argument when you come to the table saying, like, what have you done, and why do you feel like that should be something you should you know be recognized for? Uh, hopefully that helps. Eric, thanks, thank Anandu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else want to weigh in on that uh, specific question? Quelqu'un d'autre veut intervenir? Je vois Jérôme uh, la main levée. Jérôme. Yeah, I'll build on this a little bit, maybe in English, because the question was in English. I, I, The short answer is just ask. What I would add, though, is that you may not get it. So just be ready for that. And if you don't get it, you know, still take the job, perhaps, if it makes sense for you. And, and that's the key thing, start applying for higher level jobs, right? Start applying for an IT3, because we just talked about how it takes a year to go through the whole process and might be longer than that. So that's a general advice is you should always be applying for the next level so that when the time comes, um, you're ready or you have a bit of leverage. So short answer, just ask, but be prepared to get perhaps a yes, perhaps a no. Merci, Jérôme. Est-ce qu'il y a quelqu'un d'autre qui veut intervenir? Sinon, on peut passer à une autre question. On a couvert le, le sujet. Merci beaucoup. Um, the second question is anonymous. Uh, how important has networking been early in your public service career? How can students and those outside of the federal government network uh, in a virtual environment? And I, I'd like to start with Catherine, maybe, parce que tu as déjà ouvert la porte, uh, je pense, au, mm -hmm. <laughs> au réseautage, disons-le comme ça. Alors, uh, à toi la parole. Merci. Ben, oui, le réseautage a été et continue d'être une partie très importante de ma carrière. En fait, uh, Je crois que depuis, depuis que j'ai commencé euh, en 2015-2016, j'ai tous mes emplois sauf un étaient à travers le réseautage. Donc, j'ai eu à peu près quatre différents postes là, dans les dernières années. Euh, puis, il y en a seulement un que j'ai passé à travers un processus formel, là, entrevue, examen, name it, j'ai passé à travers. Les autres, c'était soit j'ai rencontré des gens euh, à des différentes sessions, j'ai partagé mon CV, donc le réseautage était une, une partie très, très, très importante de ma carrière. Euh, 
Um, puis, um, donc, c'est ça. Donc, je, je l'encourage à n'importe qui qui veut, qui veut l'entendre. Um, puis, pour les étudiants qui sont euh, soit internes ou externes au gouvernement fédéral, il y, a des, il y a plusieurs opportunités. Il y a des groupes qui organisent des choses, des, des, des opportunités de, de réseautage virtuel um, euh, au courant de l'année. Là, je vais partager quelques ressources avec les organisateurs euh, du, du panel. Donc, si c'est possible de partager avec les participants. Euh, puis sinon, ça, ça revient un peu à ce qu'on disait euh, euh, quand on répondait à la question sur euh, l'application, euh, puis euh, au sein du gouvernement, c'est de trouver des moments ou trouver des gens qui font le même genre de travail que vous, qui vous intéresse, puis de, 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 de communiquer avec ces gens-là. Donc, utiliser les plateformes de médias sociaux, il y a beaucoup de, beaucoup de fonctionnaires, beaucoup de gestionnaires qui sont actifs sur euh, des plateformes comme LinkedIn. Et donc, c'est facile de, de, de communiquer avec ces gens-là, donc euh, d'envoyer un message, de dire « Hey, euh, j'ai cette expérience ici, euh, est-ce qu'on pourrait discuter? » Donc, euh, il y a ces plateformes-là, il y a des plateformes, euh, que, que ce soit Twitter, peu importe, là, il y a des groupes aussi là, sur des, des plateformes de médias sociaux comme Facebook, où est-ce que les, les postes sont, sont affichés et puis euh, des gens qui cherchent euh, des employés. C'est tout là, là c'est vraiment, tu n'as pas besoin de faire grand-chose autre que euh, lever ta main puis euh, essayer de communiquer avec ces gens-là. Donc, je dirais, c'est ça, donc euh, d'essayer de, de, d'être actif puis de trouver des gens sur les plateformes de médias sociaux. Euh, puis, euh, des fois, il y a des, c'est comme j'ai mentionné, il y a des organismes à l'intérieur du gouvernement qui organisent des, des, des événements comme ça. Puis souvent, on lance l'invitation justement des universités, des collèges euh, locaux. Euh, pour les étudiants viennent nous joindre, puis on n'a pas beaucoup de gens qui viennent des fois, donc euh, ça serait peut-être l'opportunité de, de venir puis de vous, euh, de vous présenter. Donc, euh, oui, ce serait, c'est ce que je dirais là, pour le, le réseautage. Merci, merci Catherine. Uh, I'd like to ask Charnel, do you have any uh, advice uh, regarding networking and uh, uh, career uh, development? Uh, do you want to weigh in on this? Yeah, um, I will say that I, I think Catherine covered a really great portion of like some of those key points about networking and career development. Um, I think one thing that I'll add is like for those who are maybe already in the public service, um, there's a lot of communities for young professionals, right? So like they use it's a YPN, the Youth Public Service Network. I think it's it's what it's what it's called, and um, it's really to encourage. Uh, uh, you know, new, it's really about, it's not necessarily young, the, the organization or communities or network is really about um, bringing together new public servants, right? So you can have a new public servants, you know, in their 30s or 40s, but it's nice because you have that community to really bounce things off and, 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 and ideas off of. But I agree, right? It's really kind of being able to do to reach out and um, to uh, have those coffee chats. I think it's about if your respective school at the moment, your grad school um, or program has opportunities where they're hosting events and they often kind of bring speakers from the public service to speak on a particular topic, go to those events. Um, I think when you're in the workplace as well, um, I, I, despite me, Seeing maybe like an, an extrovert, I actually like to kind of just like be to myself. And I found that I had to force myself to really go to like the work socials. <laughs> Um, you know, they're really important because that's where you get to meet your colleagues and get to know a little bit about them outside uh, the workplace, right? When you're in the work setting, it's sometimes go, 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 and you can't always have the moment to really connect and, you know, see if they went skating on the weekend, but the work socials allow you to kind of get out of that office environment to connect with you know, your colleagues on, 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 on a different type of level. So I, I would encourage you to take advantage, to, to take advantage of those opportunities when, when they do come up. Hey, thank you, Charnel. And if you don't mind, everyone, we're going to go through other questions because it's, uh, we have a lot of questions actually. So we'll try to accelerate a little bit just to co cover as many. And uh, I apologize in advance. I, I see the, the pace of questions coming in the, the Q&A box and I, I'm afraid we're not going to be able to cover them all. But I have a question, let's say uh, for Jerome here, because I know you work in, a, in an organization that do research. So is, the question is, is it mandatory to know French for research intensive job in the government, I guess, uh, mm -hmm. should, should be the, the question. Uh, to you? Right. The short answer is it depends, but mostly no. Uh, so uh, it, the federal public service is a big place. So if 
in parts of the country, maybe French is the, the requirement, but if you're in the national capital region, usually for entry level and even mid-level positions, English is the ones that you'll see more commonly. Where French becomes required is when you reach a management level and higher. So you, in my organization, as soon as you have supervisory duties, you need to have some level of bilingualism, at least according to the test. And of course, as you become an executive and higher, you need to you need to be bilingual. But it's it's certainly not uh, an impediment, I would say. And for I would encourage people who don't yet speak the second official language to apply. And then you have opportunities to learn either on the job or through professional development opportunities or on your own. And um, simply, it's only when you're trying to go a bit higher than you'll, you'll need both usually. So I don't see that as a deterrent. I know a lot of people hear us speak French and they're like, oh no, I'm, I'm really nervous. I'm not sure if I can do this or not. You absolutely can. And it's uh, I encourage you to, to join. Thank you, Jerome. I think it does answer the question uh, quite, uh, quite properly. Um, I have a question from uh, Rlo Sif here, uh, but I think it covers some of the answer that uh, Catherine has uh, um, answered a little bit earlier. Maybe someone else wants to weigh in. The question is about how can people use social media, help find a job? Uh, uh, any of you found a position through Facebook, LinkedIn, or I don't know, Twitter or another one? Uh, anyone else wants to weigh in uh, on this? Anandu, have you ever found a job on LinkedIn, for instance? What, what's your take on social media? Yeah, I think social media is really, really powerful in terms of networking and hiring. I personally have only been in my position for a year and a half, so I'm not really looking for other jobs, but there's tons of groups, uh, IMIT groups, GC policy, formal, informal groups, uh, administration groups. There's tons and tons of groups on Facebook. And I know plenty of friends who have moved on to you know, higher up positions, uh, because they qualified in a pool first and you know hiring managers will go into those uh, groups and say hey I'm looking for an EC4 or an EC5 English essential bilingual whatever it might be and they will just reach out to those hiring managers through Facebook and uh, get opportunities that way so I, I definitely recommend people to join those groups keep an eye out for those groups um, because I think like that's completely changed how hiring has happened. I even in my groups, uh, whenever we're thinking about recruiting new staff, one of the options that people always like, oh, why don't we just make a Facebook post? And when we do, we have more than a hundred people reach out. And it's in 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 my personal experience, when I've made one of those postings, it is a lot faster to get qualified applicants at hand uh, than to some of the other mediums that are more traditional. So, yeah. Hey, thanks, Anandu. And I must say, I'm on LinkedIn myself, and I always repost uh, interesting um, uh, job opportunities in my field. I think it's the right um, uh, social media to to do this. At least that's my understanding of that. Uh, amongst all of them. Um, now let, let's move to another question uh, that is relating to one of the things that I think Charnel have said uh, during her. Present, earlier presentation, you mentioned about write down all of your experiences. Were, were you referring to the questions they ask in the GC job application? Is it true that we can only have two pages max resume? Hence, we cannot pull all of our experience in a resume. So can you solve that real pr practical problem, Charnel? Yeah, for sure. So um, as mentioned from before, the government has a very unique and special process. Um, and so it's actually like it's like a multi step. So I think I'll answer the first and hopefully be able to answer the second. Um, I don't even know if we actually can do this, but I essentially take the, the, the questions that they ask and I copy and paste those questions into a Word document. And that's how I'm able to kind of answer or work on the application. So there is a system on the government website that you can work off of, um, but they're like, they time out. Like if you don't save right away, you can lose your responses. So I think a common practice amongst those who are applying to government jobs is that they'll kind of work on a separate document where they'll copy and paste the questions and then they're able to kind of take their time and really just, you know, without the like timing on and off from like the actual application. Now, in terms of like your resume being two pages, um, when it comes to like the federal public service, you'll be asked to upload your resume to the uh, job portal website. Um, and it's kind of tricky. I don't know if they've changed it now, but generally it's a copy and paste. 
Um, so that's how it works. It's, it's not the, it's not the most pretty uh, format that you're used to on your Word document. It really does distort a lot of things. Um, so in that case, I, I don't think there is a limit because there's not necessarily pages. Now, in general, about whether a resume should be two pages or not, I think there's going to be varying views. My, you know, fellow panelists might have varying views. Um, I say try to keep your resume really tight with important information. So that's not to say that your resume can't run longer than two pages, but if it does run longer than two pages, you just got to really justify to make sure that every experience listed on there is really going to be a value add and really sell yourself to that employer. If it's something that ne isn't necessarily useful or you think won't necessarily um, be value add or catch like, you know, your potential employer's eye, maybe, maybe you remove it off. I think that's a judgment call that you would have to make. Um, but speaking for myself, my resume, the longest, longest it has ever ran has been three pages. Um, and it depends on the job I'm applying to. And if I need to add that like detail and rigor because it's competitive, and I know what they're looking for, then I'll, 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 I'll make that judgment call. But my resume tends to fluctuate depending on the job I'm applying for. So it's, it's a tough question, but I would say generally, give or take, I think two pages should be the appropriate lens. Does hey, anyone want to disagree with me? <laughs> any colleagues want to disagree with me? <laughs> Uh, I don't see any disagreement here, Charnel. So we're okay. We can maybe we can move to the next question. And for the um, uh, pour, pour respecter un peu l'équilibre de uh, linguistique, je vais poser une question en français. Uh, la question nous vient de Nessan. Il nous dit bonjour, merci pour le partage de votre expérience. Faut-il nécessairement être qualifié dans un bassin pour commencer une carrière au sein du gouvernement fédéral et à part postuler aux offres sur le site Emploi GC? GC euh, du gouvernement du Canada, y a-t-il d'autres façons de se qualifier dans des bassins? Et j'aimerais poser d'abord la question à Catherine, puis s'il y a d'autres qui veulent intervenir après, il semble que j'ai l'impression que tu t'y tu connais assez bien dans, <rire> dans le processus. Alors Catherine, à toi la parole. Oui, non, tu n'as pas besoin d'être, vous n'avez pas besoin d'être euh, inscrit à un bassin ou qualifié dans un bassin pour entrer. C'est sûr que c'est une des façons euh, d'appliquer sur des bassins, puis ces bassins-là sont souvent euh, sont ouverts à plusieurs scénarios, donc euh, ça, il y a plusieurs chances, là, même s'il y a juste euh, un poste à pourvoir pour ce un bassin-là, il est quand même disponible à d'autres personnes qui cherchent des employés, donc c'est jamais mauvais d'être présent ou d'être qualifié dans un bassin. C'est aussi, ça, un bassin peut aussi servir un peu à une carte euh, pour vous promener d'un endroit à l'autre, dire euh, à, à certains gestionnaires, hey, « je suis qualifié dans ce bassin ici », ce n'est pas dans ton organisation, mais c'est au même niveau de qu ce que tu recherches. Donc, euh, tu sais, j'ai démontré que je réponds aux habiletés. Donc, être dans un bassin n'est pas mauvais, mais ça peut être difficile. Ça peut être compliqué, surtout quand on essaie d'entrer au gouvernement. Euh, si je parle de mon expérience personnelle, moi, j'ai entré euh, au gouvernement comme étudiante euh, coop. Et puis, quand j'ai terminé euh, ma maîtrise, euh, on m'a, euh, on a utilisé le mot tantôt, le bridger. Donc, on m'a... Euh, je ne sais pas, il n'y a pas vraiment de mot équivalent en français là, pour le bridging, mais on utilise l'expression anglaise. Là. Mais c'est vraiment, c'est le, 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 le faire le transfert d'un poste de, de, de rôle d'étudiant à un rôle euh, plus temps plein. Um, et donc, j'ai entré comme ça. C'était ça ma porte d'entrée à temps, à temps plein au sein du gouvernement fédéral. Um, il y a des gens qui entrent... Euh, un peu comme je l'ai mentionné tantôt, je, je me sens comme si je me répète, là, mais euh, juste en faisant un reach out à, à communiquer avec des gestionnaires qu'ils ont rencontrés dans peu importe de situation, ça peut être, tu sais, ça peut être dans n'importe quelle une, une session de, de réseautage, ça peut être tu as rencontré quelqu'un à l'épicerie, puis euh, va mentionner qu'il cherchait quelqu'un ou quelqu'un que tu as été à l'université avec. Euh, donc, il y a des façons de faire entrer des gens à la fonction publique fédérale. Euh, sans qu'ils soient euh, officiellement qualifiés dans les bassins. Donc, euh, ça prend… Des fois, il y a de ça, puis ça dépend des ministères. Là. Je ne sais pas. Moi, je, moi où est-ce que j'ai… Les ministères où est-ce que j'ai travaillé, euh, l'équipe des ressources humaines était toujours assez créative. Donc, euh, il permettait d'aller chercher des gens de différentes façons, mais il y a d'autres ministères où c'est un petit plus rigide. Donc, ça dépend vraiment de, de qui… De, de, à quelle porte que vous allez cogner. Mais je dirais que non, il y a plusieurs autres façons d'entrer de, de, au sein du au sein de la fonction publique. Là. Je sais pas si euh, Jérôme, je sais que Jérôme est, est directeur, fait que je ne sais pas si Jérôme a plus à ajouter là-dessus. 
Jérôme, voulais-tu ajouter là-dessus? Oui, je te mets un petit peu sur le spot, Jérôme. Non, pas vraiment. Je crois que tu as bien couvert le sujet. Il y a plusieurs façons d'entrer, soit suivant des compétitions, soit avoir un contrat ou un, un cash ou un, 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 un truc à tempo, euh, à, temporaire de façon limitée. Ça, ça se fait avec le réseautage. Et on a parlé de différents trucs, que ce soit Facebook, que ce soit Gads, que ce soit de, du réseautage plus organique. Et après, il y a évidemment le bridging, donc les étudiants qui peuvent passer euh, d'étudiants à, à employés. Donc, c'est les trois méthodes et ce que je suggère, catégorie de méthodes. Et donc, ce que je suggère, c'est de toutes les faire à la fois, autant que possible. Merci, Jérôme. Je crois que ça complète euh, bien cette euh, question. Alors, the next question is from Nicola Marina. My question, I feel as though I'm underqualified having studied political sciences and how and now doing public policy and public administration. Would you recommend a background such as a certificate or additional courses that might make me a more desir desirable and well-rounded candidate? It seems that the knowledge in school still has me lacking in some ways. Um, so what would you recommend someone to do well-round and well-verse themselves to now become a part of the workplace? Uh, uh, Anandu, would you like to, to, to start, kick off this, this response? You got a, a background that is not necessarily the more uh, traditional. Let's, let's kick off the conversation with you for, for I mean, for public uh, um, management job. And, and this, this relates to public, political sciences and public administration. But what, what's your take first? Yeah, no, for sure. I'm actually doing my PMP right now. Uh, like, uh, one of the things I think is really important is to keep elevating yourself throughout your career. Just because you do a master's or a PhD doesn't mean you, there's not other stuff that you can learn, right? Um, so upskilling yourself because the job market where we're heading, it's becoming very, very competitive. So you need to be upskilling yourself constantly in your job as well as through other avenues as well. So I guess back to the question, it really depends on what kind of jobs you're applying for. For a lot of these program management or delivery jobs, uh, certifications are really, really valuable. That's what I've, like, it's been my past experience as well. Uh, but for example, if you're trying to do something in product management, a CSPO certification might be really valuable. And I'm speak strictly speaking from a, like a digital and technology perspective. There's a lot of qualifications, uh, especially when we apply for these IT pools that they look for, they'll specifically say, you know, PMP is an asset or a CSPO is an asset. Um, and what they're basically saying is that we'd really, really like, it's not required for the job, but if you have those certifications, it makes you be a valuable candidate, right? So I think that's the perspective that I try to take is like always keep upskilling yourself uh, and never be satisfied because everything is elevating and changing and evolving and you want to be there evolving with the times, right? You don't want to kind of just say, you know, I'm okay with where I am and, uh, you know, I, I, maybe that's fine. But at the same time, if you want to keep moving up, you definitely have to upskill yourself. And I think you need to be strategic on where you want to take your career. For example, if you're not working digital service delivery and you don't really care about product management, a CSPO certification is not going to do you any good in policy. It, it might, but probably not, right? You have to be clever on how you actually utilize versus a PMP is more of a general certification. And a lot of policy people that I know have, are PMP certified. Uh, so it really, really depends on where you want to take your career. All right, Anandu, thank you very much. And I see Charnel wants to jump in. Please go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I might just say, so I, I agree with um, Anandu's uh, uh, quest, uh, response, sorry. And I'll just say that, like, based on, like, the questions you've asked, and you have an undergrad in political science, and you have a graduate degree in, in, in public policy, it seems to me that like, I, I don't think you're underqualified and my, and these are, again, these are all assumptions because I'm only going off what you've mentioned in, in, in your question, but it seems as though you're interested in the policy field. So I think having both an undergrad and a graduate degree has probably given you a really good foundation of what it takes to kind of work in the public policy sphere or public administration. Perhaps maybe what you would like to do is try to get some of ex some experience in um, you know maybe that domain. I know maybe for instance in the public service they might ask in the job applications for all this experience that you feel that you might not have and you're hoping that your your academic experience would have given that to you. It did. It gave you the knowledge and it gave you the ability to write how to really critically think, analyze. And so there's 
if if you need a little bit more experience, see if like your schools have opportunities to kind of contribute to like um, those like newspaper columns where you really get to kind of put out articles on particular topics and do that policy analysis. Um, see if there's ways where you can kind of volunteer and and, and start working on um, research or analysis or putting together briefs or or think like pieces, right? Just to kind of essentially allow you to kind of really use those skills that you learned in school. But it seems like you have the academic experience. So maybe what's missing is like that work component. And oftentimes if you don't have work experience yet, volunteer is a really good start or an internship. And then from there, it just starts building, right? Cause now you have the experience to really be able to land yourself something else. But I'm happy to chat with you also offline if, if, if need be. Sharnel, I totally concur with you. And we need to say to Nicholas, he has a really good foundation, right? Just uh, the experience maybe that is missing, but don't be, be trust yourself, Nicholas. I'm sure you, you, you will, you will get there at some point. Listen, the time flies and I'm going to take only one last question and it's from uh, Rolf Sif. Um, are you aware of any, and I'm, I'm asking this question because we're in the middle of a competition today. So I'm going to take that opportunity. Are you aware of any competition or challenges organized by the government that can help university students have their first job experience as public servants? It's a good question, but um, you know, I just think it it fits with the uh, the context of today's uh, competition. Any takes on this? Anyone? Sarnel, might, go ahead. I might jump in. So there are a few uh, job processes that are geared generally towards undergrad or grad or new, sorry, newly uh, graduate students. That was the question, right? If there's any kind of like specific, so. Wait, was that the question? Because I don't want to answer it that, if that well, was it. Well, the, the question was around competitions or challenges that are organized by the government to get a, a job. I, I feel that there are some some specific uh, recruitment processes that, yeah. you know, very, uh, very focus on some sectors or some. So maybe that's how I will interpret interpret this question. Okay, okay that's how I interpret it interpreted as well. Uh, so there's a few. So there's the RPL, which is the, I, I, I don't know, research. It's RPL, the Recruitment Policy Leaders Program. So that's one that I would encourage you to kind of like look into. Uh, there's also a few developmental programs. So there's the uh, APAP program. So the Advanced Policy Analyst Program, um, where essentially kind of, uh, they bring students in or recent grads at an EC3, I believe. Um, and then within two years, they kind of work with them um, and, to, uh, and move them up kind of like the ladder into an EC5. You get experience at central agencies, all three, and then you're kind of sponsored by like a line department. I know Natural Resource Canada also has their own. Um, I think it's called PARDIP. Uh, it's, it's also a developmental program. So. Those are the three off the top of my head that really, really gear, um, that are geared towards recent graduates, both undergrad and graduate. Yes, yeah, Sean Ellen, I would say keep an eye on on these type of con, uh, competitions and uh, apply for it. Uh, you know what? It's really time to to close this uh, this conversation. It was way too short. But that's all the time we have today. And I would like to thank our wonderful panelists. Uh, I'm sure you will agree with me that it was a fantastic discussion. I hope that it was useful for all the attendees as well. Uh, I would like to thank you, the participants, and thank you for your questions. There's so many other questions that are asked, and I invite you to keep uh, the conversation going and ask us questions, ask the panel questions through uh, social media, LinkedIn, or, or keep connected. I'll, I'll accept myself any invitation from, from you in LinkedIn, and I'm sure it's going to be the same for the panel, for the panelists. Au nom de l'École de la Fonction publique du Canada, donc, j'aimerais remercier euh, LAC, LACPA d'avoir organisé le concours national d'études de cas pour le, le public étudiant de cette année. Je remercie également ceux et celles qui ont assisté à l'événement d'aujourd'hui et ont participé à cette discussion. Nous espérons que vous avez trouvé cette séance utile et que vous allez envisager une éventuelle carrière au sein de la fonction publique du Canada. If you enjoyed this event, the Canada School of Public Service has 
an annual national student paper competition where students can submit a 1,500 words paper focusing on the current priorities and concerns of the government of Canada for the chance to win a four month internship with the Canadian Federal Public Service. For more information and opportunities, you can always visit the CSPS website under partnerships and initiative. Once again, thank you so much for joining us on this Saturday, and I wish you all the best in the case competition. Thank you all. Bye bye.